Hello, I am Colombo Blango. I have lived in the constituency and in London Borough of Southwark for so long. I have been a councillor in the borough since 1998. My children went to school in the constituency. I have had the honour to serve as the mayor of the borough. And also subsequently, I went on to be the executive member for various portfolio responsibilities. During my time as a councillor in Sedak, I have fought for a lot of vital issues, such as education, poverty, equality, community cohesion and engagement, education. However, if you're watching live, you can send your questions through um, the Facebook live and then your questions will be asked or you can make your comments and feel free to share, create a watch party of your own. Let's share this because um, this is a privilege to have somebody with such a wealth of knowledge. So let's move on. You're now in the UK. And um, as I say, you were a qualified teacher in Sierra Leone. You moved to the UK. And um, what got you into politics? What got, no, what got you interested in politics, first of all? And why um, at that time, the Liberal Democrats, please, if you could be brief. <laughs> if I could be brief, are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I, I get my political consciousness and awareness in Sierra Leone. Yeah, you said. I was not politically active in Sierra Leone, but I was very conscious and very aware from my early days. I told you I grew up in the SLST to NDMC time in Sierra Leone. Yeah, I grew up there and I was very fortunate to have scholarship um, from primary school days all throughout and to be exposed to all these privileges. And I saw, when I, if I want to map out mm. my political experience or my political awareness um, in Sierra Leone, I can base it on that SLST NDMC environment. Yeah which was reflected in the whole of the country. I saw and I grew up in a system that is the SLST NDMC system that was working perfectly with good governance, good management, good care for workers, good responsibility and good provision for workers taking care of the environment, um, taking care of the communities and taking care of children of workers. I saw that happening at its highest and at its best. And I realized why that was happening. And also I went through that and began to saw the deterioration of all of that. Mm. And I saw how everything vanished, how everything really became um, sort of, um, what was the word I want to use? Um, eroded yeah. completely, right? From good management, good governance, good community engagement, good community um, um, sort of um, provision, workers' rights to nothing. Mm -hmm. So what changed? Yeah. What changed? Well, management changed, okay? They naturalized, I mean, they nationalized the company mm -hmm. from NDMC to SLST, yeah? That was the first major change. They nationalized it, okay. At that initial stage, when they nationalized the, the company, they brought in very good managers, Sierra Leone managers, okay? Who continued for a few years the same process, but what went into the mix was government representatives. That was the time Shekhar Stevens started appointing government representatives to represent government in those mining companies. Right. And the job of the government representatives was to siphon money to the government and then deprive. I mean, so corruption started, right? Every, all the opportunities started disappearing. Electricity started, um, they started rationing electricity. 
They started rationing food. Um, everything just deteriorated. Mm. And that reflected on the country from good management to bad management. So basically, I, through NDMC, I saw what good management means and what poor management means and the consequences. Mm. And when I went out of that environment to the rest of Sierra Leone, I noticed for the very same reasons, Sierra Leone came from top to down. Wow. So now you're in the UK, Let, um, and then you are now in the UK, and then you said with the political um, surroundings, grounding that you have. Okay, yeah, I, I, okay, yeah, okay, I got to that. Okay, yeah. um, when I left Sierra Leone, I became a student activist, yeah? I was part, when I was at university, I was part of the student union. Uh, I was never interested in leading or taking any lead in the student union. My role was to advocate and campaign for leaders to lead the student union. We led a lot of strikes. We protested. I was a very much radical student activist. And I was always on the left um, because I saw so much injustice in Sierra Leone. Yeah. My aim of being a student activist was to fight against any form of injustice. If the student union is not performing the way they should be performing, I see any form of corruption, I will lead a revolt against, not that I will be interested in taking over, I would just lead a revolt against that particular administration. Is this because you, you, you had the know-how? Yeah, because that is what I enjoy best in politics. Okay. I enjoy well, I enjoy being in the dark room. I enjoy like if um, DJ Little wants to stand for position, political position or any position, I enjoy going in to campaign for DJ Little. Um, I, I, I enjoy the, the, the battle. I enjoy being in the dark room. I enjoy being where the boats are not me. I enjoy being, enjoy being, enjoy using my brain to see how um, we can outsmart other candidates. That has been what has interested me all along in politics. People ask me, why don't you put your name forward for leadership? I said, no, because I don't think um, people will gel up to my, to my style because um, I'm more of the center-right centrist or center-leftist. Um, center I'm more of a center-leftist politician. I have a passion I cannot compromise. I have a passion for social, social justice. Uh, my whole life, why I entered politics in the first place, is to fight against injustice. Okay, when I came to Britain, your question, how did I get into British politics and yeah. why did I get into British politics? That's correct. Um, when I came to Britain, I used to live in Rotherhithe. Okay? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of politics around. I came to Britain at the time when they were just about to do a general election. Yeah. Okay? I came to Britain in 1992. And I think that year, 19, late that year, 1992, I came, yeah, that, no, I came 1991, December 1991. In May 1992, there was an election. So I, they were dropping leaflets at our door. But at the same time, you know, in this country, you have um, what you call estate, community estate meetings. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. So I used to attend those community estate meetings. Uh, it's all over every borough has got it, but particularly Sodok. Um, those are meetings people, residents in your, uh, people attend to know what is happening in your community, to know what is happening um, um, in, your, in your area. So I used to attend those meetings and I used to participate in those meetings and I did not just go to those meetings as, as a passerby. Uh, I had issues, for example, um, I was advocating for uh, a cleaner street. Our streets were dirty around where I was. They were not clearing the, the, the garbage. 
They were not emptying the bins. And all this, so they were not cleaning our corridors. So I will go to these meetings to put across all these issues. So you're very right? vocal. Yeah, I was very vocal in these meetings. Mm -hmm. So one day after the meeting, somebody called me and said, look, I've observed you for the past three, four months. You've been coming to these meetings and you come with issues yeah. and you're passionate about these issues. You're passionate about your community. Have you ever thought about going to local politics, represent your local area? I said, no. I never thought about it. Um, I'm just passionate about my community where I live, especially my block, mm. um, so that we get proper services because we pay service charges and we're not getting services. Yeah. And um, I said, well, um, think about it. And um, what I did, elections were going on, started that time, you yeah. know, people campaign all the time. So leaflets were dropping through our door. So I read the conservative manifesto I read the Labour Manifesto and I read the Liberal Democrat Manifesto. I read them keenly. And to really, because before you go into politics, you got to know why you're going to politics and you got to align yourself with a political party that share the same values. Values as what you want, yeah. Yeah, as what you want. Yeah. Um, honestly, I'm not a conservative by nature. Uh, I am not too rigid about what I do things, about yeah. how I do things. That, that's uh, a bit questionable because I'm, well, I'm not saying that I do respect what you've just said, but based on the affluent um, upbringing where you were born in, and one may think that, okay, um, it would have been naturally easier for you to default into um, some sort of a conservative style politics because, as you said, you were, you were born with silver spoon, you had an affluent upbringing, you were educated in private school throughout your, from age six and upwards. So one may think naturally, this man, a conservative man by blood. Interesting you say that. Yeah. But in my family and the schools I attended, mm. they, they encourage us to use our talent. They encourage us to, for free thinking. They encourage us to use our initiatives. Once you've got initiatives, you've got talent, you are guided. Nobody tells us you should follow that line, you should follow this line of action. No, um, my era was a radical era, right? 70s to the 80s. Those are the most radical areas in Sierra Leone, especially for students, mm. okay? So I grew up, as much as I grew up in that sort of, I wouldn't say a conservative background, but I grew up in an organized, affluent, um, constructive background where you had the opportunity to make your own decision, to use your talent, to use your initiative, right? As long as you had a good initiative, somebody will look at your initiative and encourage you to go ahead and <laughs> use your initiative. So um, also because I grew up from age six until I finished um, university, basically on my own in the boarding, boarding school, mm. right? So I had the opportunity to, opportunity to make my own decisions. I had the opportunity to look at things and rationalize and try to figure out what is best. I did not grow up in that sort of um, open, place wherein I had to follow the rules, the conservative rules. This is how we do things in our community. Okay. This is how our elders have done it. This is how our forefathers have done it. I did not grow up along that line. Mm. I grew up being encouraged to use my initiative. So I did not grow up, I, even though I grew up to appreciate um, tradition, around you. Yeah. tradition and customs. I grew up to appreciate them, yeah. but also I grew up to um, question them if they are, if they could stand up to up to the times. I grew up to understand that some customs and traditions need to be modernized, and I grew up to understand that the world is moving, so you cannot stick in one place. Um, locked in your cocoon, saying you're following customs and tradition. Yeah, you can keep customs and traditions, but 
um, you should be prepared to, 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 to reform. So, and that is the whole thing about liberalism. Liberalism is conservatism with a small c. Liberal, the liberal party is an offspring of the conservative party. All right? The liberal party is a conservative party with a small c. So we are conservative with a small c, but open to reform, right? Not sticking to those old conservative principles, outdated principles. No, we don't stick to it. We want to reform. We want to revolutionize. I read the Labour Manifesto, right? Um, I, I am split between conservative liberals and socialist liberals, okay? The conservative is completely conservative. The socialist, the Labour Party, the socialists are completely socialist, mm. okay? I don't want to be a complex. I, I carry some of the ideas. I respect and understand and appreciate some of their beliefs. Mm. Like they are also very strong in social justice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I take all of that. Mm. And they're very strong in civil liberty. I take all of that. But the main, the main objective, the main policy and profile of liberal democracy is based around civil liberty and social justice and equality. So liberalism combines part of conservatism and part of um, 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 socialism. So I am in the center left of that. So I deliberately, after doing my examinations, I de deliberately choose um, um, liberalism, okay? Um, it's good to be liberal, it's good to have um, a mind of your own, it's good to be progressive, well, I call myself a progressive liberal. So I went through the manifesto and I was encouraged by somebody in the Liberal Democrat who have seen me perform yeah. in my community meetings and said, look, you could be a good politician. I see you talking with passion and I see you have some liberal views. Yeah. So why not join the Liberal Party? That was when I went away and read all these manifestos. And after that, I met, I met with him and I said, look, I'm ready to sign up for the Liberal Democrats. And that is how I became, I signed up. So I signed up for the Liberal Democrat Party in 1995. Wow. Yeah. And I ran for the council in 1998 and I won. So I joined the party, 95, 96, 97, 98. And four years after I joined the party, I won my first election. Wow. That must, that, that must have been an achievement. I'm, I'm just gobsmacked. That must have been an achievement. So I've, I've been one that um, first, many people like um, in within uh, as a Sierra Leonean or within the Afro-Caribbean community would have been uh, content, so to speak. They'll be like, you know what? That's a big step because you'll be pinching yourself thinking, inside four years, I don't get here now already. I'm, I've become a counselor already. And um, what was the drive to thinking um, there is more to me. Was this again somebody recognizing your 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 extreme talent, or what that you have more to offer as a counselor? What was it, well, or was it you yourself was self driven, self motivated, well, it, and then you had it, the eye on the price? It was both ways. Okay. Um, one advantage about this country, whatever you say, in the Western world, people see your talent, and they know if you're useful and you have that talent, they will promote you. True. They will encourage you. Yeah. They will facilitate you. Unlike in Africa or African communities, um, this from personal experience yeah. um, in Sierra Leone, they see you with your talent. Instead of promoting you, they either want to use you or bring you down. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would say this for free and I can no, defend I, it. I, I, I've had a personal experience. But what basically happened, this gentleman who is a white man saw my talent. I mean, sometimes you have a talent, but you never know you are happy with the little you are doing. You will never recognize how much else you can do. Like, for instance, in my school days, I had a talent in sports, in athletics, and I never knew how much more I could do until my game's teacher, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dominic Embassy. I will always remember him. He's now in the United States. 
yeah. until he pulled me out and said, look, I can see a talent with you in you. I will encourage you to do more. So if it were not for Mr. Dominic Yambasu, mm -hmm. I'll have just been happy with the, with the minimum. I will have been happy just running around, um, winning inter-house competitions. Yeah. I, will, I may not have thought about going beyond that up to international level. So also when I started going to these community, community meetings, yeah, mm. this gentleman saw me and I also did my homework. So it's two ways. First, it was me by my performance at these meetings. And honestly, I just went to these meetings to make a genuine case about what is going on in my estate. Because of genuine what you're passionate case. about. Yeah, what I'm passionate about. Genuine case on behalf of my estate, okay? My estate selected me to represent them because we have little meetings and they say, okay, there is this community meeting, go there and represent. And in these meetings, you have counselors who attend these meetings. So that is where generally I went there, advocated for my estate. We wanted a clean estate. We wanted service delivery done on time, on time. Um, garbage and rubbish picked up on time. So that was my sort of passion, okay? And somebody picked me up and said, look, you have a talent. Left with me alone, I'll have been happy just going to these meetings, advocating for my estate, okay? Um, and as long as that was done, garbages were cleared, and services were delivered, I'll have been happy with that. And this gentleman said, look, you can do more than this. Mm. You can represent a whole ward. You can represent a whole borough. You can represent a whole constituency. I said, are you sure about that? Wow. Okay. And um, he showed me the way. And I registered for the Liberal Democrat. And I started attending big meetings, bigger meetings. And from those bigger meetings, I was encouraged to stand for leadership within the Liberal Democrat um, constituency group. Wow. So I went in there as a secretary general for the Liberal Democrat constituency group in Sudok, I mean, in Rotherhide. And later I became the chairman of that group. And from there, this is all within two years. And from there, um, I was, um, I put in my application to be elected or selected to be a council, a candidate for the council. I went through that and I passed it. Uh, but along that, I was also very active in my local church. That right. is also very important to, to mention. Okay. Right? Which, which the, is a sacred heart. No, it yeah. is not sacred. I was, then I was living in Rotherhide. Rotherhide, okay. Yeah, I was, I was attending my local Catholic church. Okay. Church, church of the Immaculate Conceptions, okay. right? I was a volunteer there. and I used to prepare young boys and girls for catechism, for baptism and then for confirmation. I used to prepare them. We took a lot of time, a lot of evenings prepare because it's a six month program to prepare them, young boys and girls to receive the baptism and also to receive their first communion. It's a big ceremony. These are two big sacraments in the Catholic church. Mm. Okay. So I used to volunteer to go to, to church in the evening to prepare them, give them lessons. And I also used to volunteer to clean the church. So all around in the community, I was involved. And I got involved in the local politics, community politics, went, stood, as, stood for the council in 1998, and I won for the first time. Yeah. And, and you, when I, you became when a councillor. I, I became a councillor. And because of my experience and passion in education, but before then, I have been a teacher for for about eight years, yeah, I've been in, a teacher. In so the my UK. first in, yeah, the, in UK. the UK, yes. yeah. So my, and my first four years on the council, I was a teacher as well. So this was a double warming. So you were balanced in both tasks. Yes, I will. And being a councillor or being on the council, you have to attend a lot of meetings in the evenings. So I would spend my whole day at work, and then come to begin to attend meetings at six o'clock. Most of the meetings start at six. Some of them start at seven. And you will be in this meeting sometimes at 11 o'clock or to 12 o'clock at night. So 
I'm just going to uh, interject, um, you. Um, I do apologize, and I know viewers hate me for that because I've got people that always say, "Oh, little left lady person talk." When, but I just want to pick you up, and I'll, I'll allow you to flow. How did you manage to find family time? Well, that I was just going to come to that, right? <laughs> um, it's very difficult. Mm. It's very difficult. Um, sometimes, um, your sometimes your partner may not quite understand what you're about. And the sort of things that we hear from friends is that you know, if you are lost per per Columba Black, we go sit on like us. But they never knew what I was doing, right? Because you have to be out there. The Saturdays, Sundays, well, I will make sure say I try as best as possible to go to mass, and after mass, I will begin my political campaign. And whether it's raining whether it is snowing or it's hot, you have to be out there delivering leaflets. And you know how difficult it is to go through, climb up those exits, deliver leaflets in every home. Yeah. Maybe you have to deliver six, 600 leaflets in a week or in one weekend, 600 leaflets in one weekend. So your whole Saturday and Sunday is gone delivering leaflets. And Monday to Friday, you are at work from work you go into meetings. So a lot of times it created fiction, I mean friction, sorry. And it takes a lot of explanation for your partner or your wife to understand what you're up to. Um, you, you, you don't have much time for the children, but I was very lucky. My mother-in-law was around and my mother was around. So the feeling that gap. In, 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 in taking care of the children, in helping my wife take care of the children. Yeah, so I was very the fortunate. Must have been, the kids must have been young at that age. Oh yeah, they were very young. They were very younger then. Yeah, but I always made sure I took them away for holiday. I took every single holiday, I took, I took them away. We either go to America, we went to Canada and other places, or I take them to Disneyland. So that was how I compensated. So I can they, only they, they, will, they will get that valuable <laughs> three to four weeks of your time and then yes, 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 yes. And mom, mom will stay at home and have fun with the grandparents. Yeah. So yeah. I would take that bowling away from, from mom. So I always took them on every long vacation holiday. That was what I did. Disneyland or take them to America, take them to Canada, take them to different places. Right. Yeah. So let's Fantastic. Let's move into the um, where the opportunities um, was created to moving on from becoming a councillor to um, achieving to be the first, you know, non-African-born um, mayor of Southern Council, and um, not only that, a Sierra Leonean to attain that office. How did that happen, Blango? And okay. What were the inspirations or who were the inspirators behind it? Okay. Um, I was young, vibrant, energetic, motivated, wanted to achieve a lot of things. Mm. Yeah, I had the energy. I had the drive. I entered the council um, in 1998. Okay, 1998. That was when I first became councillor. Yeah. So... Those four, four years, I was still teaching, okay? And I was on the council. But my performance on the council, asking questions, delivering things, um, engaging people. So I become, and the Liberal Democrat was in opposition then. Yeah. Labor was in charge of the council. So while we're on the opposition, I became an opposition spokesperson for the Liberal Democrat for community relations, community engagement, equality, sports, and education. Yeah. And I was on various committees. In fact, then I was chair of the council's education committee. Okay. So I had all this, even during opposition, I had all this, um, I was on the shadow cabinet. So you were doing decathlon in politics as well. <laughs> yes, definitely. I was on the shadow cabinet yeah. in opposition. And I was the Southern Council Chair of the Education Committee. Wow. Okay. So the Liberal Democrat Party gave me the opportunity to chair that committee. 
because that is my, and I got involved in a lot of school activities. Yeah. And I happened to meet a lot of Sierra Leoneans and I got involved because I was in charge of community engagement and community relations, mm -hmm. right? I had the opportunity to meet a lot of Sierra Leoneans and engage with a lot of Sierra Leonean organizations. Mm -hmm. And, I, okay. and, and it's fair to say at that time, that's when um, the UK started seeing influx of Sierraleans post um, the war. And yeah. Sadok became a home. Exactly. Sadok became a home to a lot of Sierraleans during that period. Yeah. Okay. So I got very much vibrant in this. But, and I was lucky, as I said, I was still young, vibrant, energetic, mot highly motivated. Okay. So I was able to, and at the same time, I was deputy head of department in a very big school in East London. Yeah. Yeah, a school, a state school of about 1,200 boys and girls. I was deputy head of department. So on that area, there was a huge responsibility there as well. And in my community, there was a huge responsibility. And on the council and in the civil council group, there was also... So, it was tough. It wasn't easy. And um, but with my motivation, I managed to get on with all of that. So I noticed that I could do more with opportunities, but we were in opposition. So there is little or very, what we had to do was very limited. We acted as opposition. So then in 2002, no, was it 2002? Yeah, 2002, the following election, I stood again and I did not only win, the Liberal Democrat took over the council in 2002. Interesting. Okay. Well. And that was when I thought then, we are not in control. I should move on on this. I should look for higher heights. Mm. So in 2002, going 2003, I put my name forward for the mayorship. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I thought, yeah, I had a plan. Um, you see, when you want to do something, you have a plan, you have an agenda, you have a program. In politics, like in every country, especially in this country, you have to be in the position of influence, you have to be in the position of power to be able to implement or influence your program. Sure. I have this, because I was responsible for sports in Sudok as well, while we were on the opposition. I had so much data. I've seen the community. I've seen how I have worked out the importance of sports and how a lot of young people, especially black young people, boys and girls, mm -hmm. and how the community, the communities in Sudok are lacking in sporting activities, sporting facilities, sporting opportunities, mm. which is why some of our young black boys and girls are going astray because they are not being engaged mm. in those ways. So I had this plan and I thought I could only deliver this plan if I either went on the cabinet or I became the mayor. So as mayor, you would have your own charity you support and i thought to myself let me go first for mayor i choose i will choose sports and youth as my charity get it going then after that if i go on the cabinet the program already will have been established then i will use my cabinet position or influence to just carry on with the project. But going on the cabinet straight like that will not have given me the opportunity to launch that program. Because on the cabinet, you look at a variety of programs, yeah? And that program on the cabinet will have been many, one of many programs will have, will have been looking at and may not have kicked off. Yeah. But the mayor has his or our own charity and that is paramount to the council. So I went for the mayorship. I campaigned for it. They voted for me and I won it. And I declared that my charity for that year was youth and sports. 
and I presented the program to the cabinet, they had to act on it because that is the mayor's program. You have to act on it. So that is how I was able to deliver that program for every child in the borough. Every school going child in this borough, giving young people opportunity to get involved in sports, to get involved in education and to improve their educational um, standard and sporting prowess. Yeah. And that particular year, I led the team into the um, London Youth Games. I led Sudok into the London Youth Games. Because of the Sudok Community Games, all the schools have had so much training. We have rec we recruited up to 7,000 young boys and girls in the program to take part in that program. So we had a very strong team going into the London Youth Games. And so that came first in the London Youth Games that year Fantastic. through my program. Right, listen. And, I'm, and I'm what, what, the, what the program also helped to do, hmm. you mentioned some of them. Yeah. But this was now, um, after I've left the mayorship, I went to become a cabinet member. Hmm. And I was with sports was part of my portfolio remits. Sports, international partnership, um, community engagement, equalities, all these sort of things. I had six portfolio areas yeah. under my remit. Sports was one. So I just continued with that program. So what I tried to establish in Sodok as the cabinet member responsible for sports, I tried to revamp all the dilapidated sporting areas. Some of you may remember Borges Park Tennis Court, how it was in the 80s yeah. or in the early 90s. Early it not. was a dilapidated place. So I had to search for millions of pounds to revamp that place to establish the Sodok Tennis Club, Community Tennis Club, mm. and also a Brunswick Park. I don't know if any of my listeners knew what Brunswick Park Tennis yeah. Court looked like. Yeah. We re revamped that place. It is now a modern tennis court. Mm. And Burgess Park as a whole, right? The mayor of London gave us money to make sure we um, did some good work on Sodok Park and the Burgess Park to make it uh, a place people want to go. So we establish the MX bike area. I'm sure yeah. some of you have- That's right, the BMX, the yeah. BMX, BMX bike. Yeah. And further down into, into, um, into Borges Park, you have a big field there where they do um, rugby. That's right. Where they, where, they do, where they play cricket. The sports right? center, yeah. The sports center. So yeah. we spent some good money to refurbish that field and then to build the sports center and the football field. Have you seen the football pitches there? Absolutely. With the all with the all weather track. Oh. That cost that cost us 24 million pounds to That's build that place. Wow. And it's all solar play. So and interestingly, while I while I went to launch that project, while I went to no, while I went to open that project, the project was already built. It's all solar panel, solar electricity. I invited the youth minister from Sierra Leone with some youth people. The yeah. youth minister then was Dennis Bright. I invited them to come and see how I have transformed sports in Sudok. So they were there for all those ceremonies when I was opening all those sports centers. Right. We revamped the, um, the swimming pool in Peckham, Peckham Pools. That's right. We spent about, we spent about six millions to revamp the Peckham Poles and Camberwell um, swimming pool. This is all under my six years, um, in, within my six years of my leadership of sports in, in Sudok, okay? And I established, what I established, I established youth um, partnership between Sudok and um, Sierra Leone. I invited some young people with the Minister of Youth and Sport, Dennis Bright, mm -hmm. to come to Sudok to get involved in all of these things. And I went round with them in the borough to show them all of these things so that they can go back and begin to establish some of those things we have done to encourage young people. And one of the reasons why I established all of this is because through sports, you create role models. 
through sports, you make our young people disciplined because you have to be disciplined to do sports mm -hmm. and you have to provide something interesting, something vibrant, something um, young people will enjoy doing and so that they get engaged in it rather than, rather than going into trouble. Um, also, if you could remember in, on the area of um, community engagement, yeah. um, I, was, I was a cabinet member responsible for international partnership. So what I did in that as well, apart from sports, I established a twinning relationship between civil council mm -hmm. and Kwedu New Sembel Town Council. Yeah. A twinning partnership. Because um, I was establishing twinning partnership with different countries. I did a twinning partnership with, with a town called Lagerhagen in Germany. Yeah. And also um, in a town called Clichy around um, Paris in London. I mean, I'm sorry, in France. So I thought we could establish one in one African country and I chose Sierra Leone. I chose Kwedu District um, New Sembion Town Council. Mm. By then the late uh, Madame Musa was the mayor of Kwedu Town Council. So my office invited them, the mayor of Kwedu Town Council, the minister of local government, which is, who was Siddiqui by Madden, his uh, director of local government and his other officers as well. I invited them for a six, no, for a four week um, community engagement and workshop. They were here hoping that I showed them, we went around, the council officers took them around all the service delivery points of SODOC, hoping that when they went back to Sierra Leone, they will establish all of these things around local government in our local communities, right? So, and after that, my office also invited um, the mayor of Bo, who was then um, late Mrs. Nicholas. She was the mayor of Bo. Mm -hmm. I invited herself and her team to Solo Council for a four weeks workshop to learn how to run a big council like Bo. Okay, so they had a four week workshop. Workshop they would pay, countries would pay thousands and thousands of dollars or pounds for. So herself and her entourage came, received free four weeks workshop, took them around service delivery centers, show them how to deliver the service, where they would get the resources from. And they went back hoping that will be established in more as well. So you see, outside of Sudok, I did, I did do a lot of engagement with Sierra Leone government, mm. but how far all of that went, I don't know. Um, okay, I know, but I, I don't need to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but I did my bit to make sure local government and sports and youth engagement were well established in Sierra Leone. Yeah. But politics took over all of those initiatives. See, yeah. I, I, I want that fascinating, by the way, and, and the reason I'm not often a, um, a host that goes quiet and allow my guests to just have the platform and just just. But I am fascinated. I'm in, I'm I'm learning so much because, and I think one of the key things that uh, I, I'm learning from you tonight is obviously, for, on a personal note, you've known me, you followed me, my journey as a young man developing into the southern community, in, into the southern community. But I think um, equally, it's fair enough for me to say, I think you may have been misrepresented under your tenorship as a mayor, um, as a Sierra Leonean mayor in Southwark, where many local Sierra Leoneans feel that you failed to deliver for Sierra Leone, com for the Sierra Leone community. How would you respond to this now that you have the opportunity on one of the best Sierra Leone, well, probably the best Sierra Leone, platform that has the biggest reach to Salian communities in Sodok specifically, which is Diaspora Voices. How would you respond to the Salian community to say, look, I am a Salian, I represented Sodok Council, but more with everything that you've laid out on the plate, I served my people. What, how would you respond, Blango? Okay, yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. And 
And even if he didn't ask me, I was going to talk about it. Okay. Because, um, as you rightly said, uh, in many quarters, I was misunderstood and misrepresented, right? Now I've explained to you, and also in Sierra Leone, nobody talks about what I did for Sierra Leone and for young people in Sierra Leone. Indeed. Yeah? And how, at what level I engaged with various governments in Sierra Leone. And even during the APC time, because I was a cabinet member responsible for community relations in 2007, or 2008, February 2008. The election was in 2007. And Eskoroma won the election, APC won the election, and he made an official trip to London. That's correct. With a big entourage That's in correct. February 2000, I think 2007 or 2008. Yeah. But that was his first overseas trip after the election. Yeah. I heard that Anes Kruma was coming to visit his party loyalist in Sudok. Yeah. I heard. And they were arranging the Damilola Center That's for great. him to go and address people there. Um, I called the High Commissioner, who was uh, Mr. I've forgotten his name, who the High Commissioner was then. The quiet, uh, the very nice gentleman. I think he's deceased now, he's late. Yeah, 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 he is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody from Bump. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Nice gentleman. And I call him up and say, look, I understand the president with a high level entourage is coming into my bar mm. to talk to his party loyalists. And he said, yes. And I said, well, um, don't you think you will be unfair to the president and to the people of Sudok for the, for the president to just come into Sudok, bypass the council, and then go straight to have a meeting with Sierra Leone. And I said, well, oh. that is not going to happen. We are going the traditional way as well in, in, in London. Yeah. When you come to your borough, you have to come and pay homage to the council. So I organized that. I organized a reception for the president and his electorate. This is how I respect every government, no matter whether I support your views or not. Yeah. But once you are out there representing Sierra Leone, I give you that due respect, right? So yes. we uh, organized a reception at the council. We used the council chamber. And after that, the president and his entourage moved on. Yeah. So coming out of the Sierra Leone community set up. OK, this is what I do, how I did, OK? Mind you, I was in a very delicate situation in Sudan, yeah. right? The Sierra Leone community is huge. In Sudok, Sudok has one of the, I mean, Sudok has to now, I think, between 15 to 20,000 Sierra Leoneans in Sudok. Yeah. It, says right? that, it says about 22,000. Well, it may have gone to 22,000 now. Yeah. Okay. And Sudok is a home to the largest number of Sierra Leonean communities yeah. um, in the whole of UK put together. And when I came to the council, I noticed that with this huge number of Sierra Leoneans, Sodok was not prominent on the council agenda. True. It wasn't. I mean, uh, um, Sierra, Leonean, Sierra Leonean community was not prominent in the council agenda. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Okay. And okay, I came on the council and I quickly established my interest in trying to find out because I was in charge of community relations. So my agenda was and community engagement. My agenda was to do a survey on all ethnic minority groups in Sudan. I commissioned that survey, okay? And we found out that 42% um, of the population in Sudan were ethnic minorities. Wow. And the largest among the ethnic minorities were Sierra Leoneans, second to Nigerians, third to the Ivorians. So I had all the statistics in, in hand. My officers did that work. And I said, well, we have to look at the statistics and try to encourage. Well, I took it back to my members. I said, well, liberal Democrats, here we are. This is statistics. 
And the Liberal Democrat Party is not so good or not so known to be warm towards ethnic minorities. Yeah. Here is a statistics. Now is the time for us to be warm to the ethnic minorities. Because there is this perception out there that liberal Democrats don't encourage ethnic minorities, especially black people. That is the perception of that. But the liberal so, Democrats made you a mayor and you're an African not born in the UK. Yes. Well, I had an agenda to break that uh, sort of perception. That's good. So I had to do it slowly and piece by piece. First, get the statistics of the ethnic minority communities. Second, also get the data of Swalini and Sisodok, and also try to establish a program. And mind you, while I'm doing this, I have to prove to the council, this is politics. They can easily pick it up if you have, and I was in charge of equalities as well. I have to show that I am showing equal interest or I'm not biased towards civilian. Okay? And I don't, I had to be very careful not, not to allow people to think that because I'm from Sierra Leone, I'm showing more interest in Sierra Leoneans. Okay? So, fortunately, I was also in charge of the voluntary sector. You know, there are a lot of voluntary organizations in, in Sierra And the voluntary sector supports all of these little organizations. And my budget for the voluntary sector was 8.5 million pounds per year. So every year I would get 8.5 million pounds to distribute among the voluntary sector and other community organizations, okay? But when the applications come in for money, you will find out that the application will cost up to 15 million wow. and you only have 8.5 million. Some organizations are going to lose out. Some organizations are not going to get what they asked for. And some organizations, because their applications are so badly um, presented, they lose out completely. Yeah. Now, what I would do, because one big problem in the Australian community is the lack of information, ignorance, and not being able to go out there and ask for information. I will go to different Australian communities, give them the information, say, hey, this opportunity is there, apply. Could you believe most of them will not bother to apply? Here, I give you a typical example. Here I was a Australian business guy who had a restaurant in somewhere in Sadok. So he was rebuilding his restaurant and he intended to open that restaurant um, just about two weeks before my position as me, before I give up the mayorship. Mm. And I went to him, I said, guy, you know what? I will finish with this job in two weeks. Let's, I will come and open your restaurant officially to give you some boost. I mean, for some reason, it was very reluctant for me to do it. Okay. When I was on the, on, on, um, on the Mr. cabinet. Missed opportunity. Yeah. When I was in the cabinet, I went around giving information to Sierra Leoneans. Many of them did not take the opportunity. Some of them took the opportunity. Some of them applied and did get the money. But there was one particular business person I went to. I took the form to the person. First, when I went to that person, I said, look, apply for the form to solo council. And you know, the person tell me, oh, I don't have time to apply. You bring me the form. I took my time. I took the form to that person. The person did not apply. And what I heard later, that person was saying, oh, um, Mayor Blango, um, he just came and gave me form. I thought he was coming to give me money to build my place. Uh, that was what I expected of him, to come and give me money. Cash. <laughs> what he brought to me 
He's not a helpful guy. What he brought to me was the phone. But hold on a minute. And I give you a lot of other examples. I give you two more, not to waste your time. Two more examples or three more. Um, some Australians will come to my office. They will say um, they don't have place to lay their heads. They want housing. Okay, I said, fine. Yeah, I want every citizen in Sodok to be housed. And I said, but we'll have the process. This is what you have to do, A, B, C, D, to get you on the queue, right? Could you believe some of them will go back and say, I am not helpful. Why? Because they expected me to pick up the phone and call somebody in the council to say, hey, my guy is here. Please find him a house. So is that mentality? It that's operates that's different. That's the they want you to apply the Sierra politics. Exactly. <laughs> they wanted me to be corrupt. But I will go as helping them, showing them the way. Yeah. And for one or two, I even follow up on their application. Mm. All you need to do, take the form, apply, go through the process, and then you'll get somebody to follow up on your application. That is all you have to do. You see, so all of these sort of things. And also uh, because coming to the voluntary sector, because the money was so small, okay, some Australian organizations will put in application for 10,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they will end up having maybe 5,000, 6,000, but they will not get all of the money, okay? because the money had to be divided equitably. Yeah. So what I decided, I decided to identify all Sierra Leone organizations in the borough. I was able to identify about 25 of them. And I let my officer write to all of them to invite their leadership to a meeting in my office, in, I mean, um, in, in the town hall. Okay, and I also arrange for top senior officers and the leader of the council to sit in this meeting. Okay, mm. um, but before that, I've had a discussion with them while I'm inviting them. I said, look, all of you, the money you are applying to solar council for, put together, is up to 500,000 pounds, but you're never ever going to get it. All you can get as, as an organization on your own is maximum 10,000, 5,000. So if you come together and form one body with one umbrella organization, you have the right to apply for a million pounds or even two millions from the European community. Because all of you put together, your activities will go way beyond Sadak. So you apply for a money, I mean, for that amount of money that will meet your needs. And as one body, one organization, apply on, um, through one umbrella um, group, you will get that money. So by that, you will have enough money for each one of your organizations to do what they want to do. We had our first meeting. We had our second meeting. They elected their chair and they elected a safety general. Guess what happened? So we are going to give them training. I had already arranged for officers to set up a constitution for them, yeah. for that body. Was that the Serian umbrella, um, some sort of Serian umbrella, I think? Serian uh, Forum. Serian Forum. Yeah, you heard about it. Yes, yeah. I was very young at the time. Yeah, yes. and what I did, I did not only employ officers to help them, to set up the organization, to write out, to write, I help them, I, um, I sent officers to help them also write their constitution. And they were working with high level officers. Guess what happened? I started getting letters from different people in that organization against all the members of that organization. And it went to the point they even wrote directly to the chief executive and they wrote directly bypassing me, they wrote a letter to the, the, the leader of the council. 
Oh. And the leader of the council, who was a liberal democrat, called me and said, see what your people are doing. And you know what I did? Because they were fighting each other now. Yeah. Because they've seen all these big opportunities. They were fighting each other. And they were not only fighting each other, but they were really backstabbing each other directly to the top. And I said, what? I called a meeting of my officers and I squashed everything. I said, write to them, tell them the organization is squashed and it's officers bad. are no more going to involve in, this, in helping you. I stopped it because I saw where they were going. I was going to get the blame. Yeah. Officers already started blaming me. Oh, I'm Councillor Blango because he's, he's from Sierra Leone, which is why he's letting this thing happen. I heard it, okay? So I gave orders for them to cancel it, write to each one of them to say, the organization has been dissolved. They should not be in touch with the council anymore. So that is how I dissolved that one. But what I did afterwards, I tried to get some money to do some studies on specific organizations. I skipped the Sierra Leone specific communities. I skipped the Sierra Leone communities. I went first for the um, Ivorian communities, French, yeah. French speaking community. Because what I did, I, I told my officers to divide the black and minority ethnic community in Sudok as um, French speaking and English speaking. Yeah. So we're going to take one of those communities from this French speaking community and do a thorough needs assessment, needs assessment study on them. And after that, we take one community in the English speaking community. So we chose the Ivorian community. And Choosing the Ivorian community, we provided 15,000 pounds. No, 12,000 pounds. I commissioned 12,000 pounds, made sure we found a, a French speaking Ivorian community social worker to do the, the survey and to write the, 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 the document about needs assessment on Ivorian community. All right? Uh, where they live how long they've been in this country, their educational needs, their professional needs, the needs for their children, health needs. So there were about 10 categories they had to cover. Okay, I've just named about seven. Yeah. But, uh, and what their handicaps were, what some of their problems are, and access to social services, all those things. So I gave them three months to do those studies for 12, thousand pounds working with a social worker from the Ivorian community working with uh, with my officers they came up with a brilliant flamboyant report full of statistics full of graphs colored and we launched that report big time with the whole of the Ivorian community in Soda we launched that report six months down the line I said well we should do a report on the English speaking community. Mm. And I chose the Sierra Leonean community for them to do the report on. My excuse was the, the English speaking communities, English speaking communities, all very similar. Ghanaian, Nigerians, Kenyans. So let's take Sierra Leone. Yeah. So what I did, I employed a Sierra Leonean. Yeah? Yeah. To work with the, with the officers. Yeah, and as I did employ um, an Ivorian social worker, community worker, I also employed a Sierra Leone community social worker to do the research. But along that, I also employed a, um, another Sierra Leonean to work with the officers. So these are two different things, okay? I don't want to call the person's name, but for the Sierra Leone and English speaking community, I commissioned 20,000 pounds. And this person whom I know very well, a Sierra Leonean whom I know very well, I don't want to call the names, okay, was to be reporting to me personally every four weeks, hmm. okay, to update me. First four weeks, no report. We've already commissioned the 20,000 pounds. Second four weeks, no report. 
Okay, and they had three months to deliver this report. Cutting a long story short, the day for to deliver the report, the council officers, the chief executive, leaders of the council, other councillors, and a whole host of Australians. We took a whole hall in the council, um, 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 on the council, to deliver this report, to launch this report. Mm. Guess what? This person produced a two-page A4 report. Mm. Two-page. I bowed my head in shame. A two-page. The Ivorian community presented a brochure. 15-page oh, wow. report with statistics. This person presented a two A4 page report. Wow. Could you believe? For 20,000 pounds. From that moment, I gave up. Wow. Um, because I was getting the flack. You have to be very careful. Understandably. I, understandably. I am from Sierra Leone. Yeah, understandably. Right? I am from Sierra Leone. But whatever, what I did, I encouraged officers to engage Sierra Leone community members, and I took myself out of it. Because there were rumors going around, this guy has wasted 20,000 pounds on Sierra Leone community because he's a Sierra Leonean. And, but it's, that's, that's just a fair criticism from, from your people and your employers at the time, because I would assume um, if I'm your employer, irrespective if I'm selling or non selling in, I would have the right to um, um, position you or place you within the same spec uh, uh, sphere that, well, there's some sort of conscious biasness and, and um, you're, those whom you've been conscious yeah. biased towards have failed and all because you are. But another question uh, I want to ask uh, on that note is like, um, I think one of the one of the the, the, the uh, areas where Selenians, again, the wider public, especially in Sodok, feels a little bit aggrieved is that um, the failure to deliver the all elusive um, community center, which we are as yet to achieve. Well, where well, hold, on, yeah, yeah, hold on a minute. Yeah. That report, yeah. that report I commissioned. Yeah. The aim was to come out with a comprehensive report, better and more informative about the needs of Sierra Leonean communities in terms of health, education, their children, access to services, all those 10 areas, yeah. like the Avarian community did. They were supposed to come, which is why we, because the Sierra Leonean community is a bigger community, while we have giving the Ivorian community 12,000 to do their own research, we gave the Sierra Leonean community 20,000 to come up with that report. I don't care, man. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, to, come up with, to come up with that report. This is the Aspora Voices. We want the juice. Salon talk. I want the juice. I want the name. <laughs> well, your, your, your former ambassador to America. Oh, wow. What's his name? Oh, wow. I don't recall the name. You former, that was the period they appointed him as ambassador to America, to New York. So you find out the name. Uh, uh. <laughs> right. Then, another thing I did, yes. when I established the Sodor Community Games, oh my I made, God. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. And that was a guy uh, they made, uh, that was a guy they made ambassador so, that's ridiculous. So that was the guy that made sure after messing up, or after messing up, after throwing 20,000 pounds in the drain, depriving the Australian community, because the aim of the report, as we discussed, we were used because I was a young boy at the time, young guy playing football, and there was um, elements of that um, under um, Blango sponsorship. Um, we were because we were playing football, and we yeah, were, I will come to that in a minute. I will come to that. Blango was sponsoring football for young people, which yes. we were in the team, and that was um, and we were getting just ordinary sandwich every Saturday with um, just cheese, cheese sandwich, and um, maybe one more to water, 
and all of that sort of day. We were playing and like, like okay, we were excited at the time. We had the, some training that they, they put up, put out, they can pick with the van, no, they can't, no, they turn up on time. You know, sometimes we have to make our own way. There was a whole heap of young, so um, these were like tick box exercise that this yeah. person was going back to Blango and say, look, I got a bunch of young salon people that were, were at a mentor under the pool. This is ridiculous. Um, well, you, you never spoke out. I know, I understand your diplomacy, no, uh, your position yeah, of office, uh, you could not. Um, yeah. but I felt, and, and I think that's the reason why um, the wider community that does not- no, I, I, I don't like talking about but I, I appreciate the opportunity yeah. to explain myself to the broader Sierra Leone community. Well, this you is ask the right about the communities, you can ask about the community, but some Sierra Leoneans know about this, yeah. right? Like Juma Bar. Yeah. Juma Bar was a guy I, I employed yeah. And he did a very good job. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. He's yes, he did a very good guy. job. Sarah, he was a guy, yeah. I met him and said, look, we want somebody for work with my officers, mm. yeah? Mm. To help this guy, uh, this Stevens guy whom I've employed to do this document. Yeah. And one of the aim of that document was supposed to be comprehensive addressing the Sierra Union needs in Soto. and. The whole plan was take this report, give a copy to Solo Council, present it to Solo Council, give a copy to Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and give a copy to DFI mm. to do what? And the one recommendation that was going to come out of that report was to meet the Sierra Leonean needs in Sodok was to have a Sierra Leone community um, resource center. That was going to be the main recommendation from that report, to have a Sierra Leone community resource center, right? And we were going to cost it in that report. Then I was going to use my position to push that report in higher places, like home office, foreign and commonwealth office, DFI. So why was your vetting process not rigorous when um, the representative at the time failed to turn up for two consecutive months to give you updates, knowing that this was a three month report? Why did you not send people to say, look, guy, come on, you know what I mean? No can put me yeah. back. Okay. Um, I kept chasing him up and Juma Bar kept chasing him up as well. He will always make promises. Oh, one time, he bring, he, I mean, one time he brought a one page report and I asked him, where are the diagrams? Where are the statistics? Where are the graphs? Where are the sections? We have four sections you should address. And each section should go with the data, uh, I mean data, should have a graph, should have a diagram. For example, education needs of Sierra Leoneans in terms of education. Where Sierra Leoneans live, what their children do, the health needs, the social needs, all of these 10 areas they were supposed to address. And the final recommendation was to address all these issues because Sierra Leone community is so large in Sada, we need a Sierra Leone community resource center. And I was going to use that report to send it upwards. After that day, when that guy presented, it was a disgrace for me. I bowed my head in shame. I abandoned the whole thing. I was so ashamed. So, and after that, I could not have gone to ask for any other specific program for Sierra Leone. Carry on talking. No, no, I would not do it. But what I succeeded in doing, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear, you, can, yeah I can hear you quite clearly, yes. I, I, just, I can see. But yeah. what I succeeded in doing, mm. I succeeded in promoting the sort of community games wherein every child, including Sierra Leonean children, had a place to play games in school, had a place to do their homework, had a place to do games in the community, had a place to, on Saturdays and Sundays to go um, sports training, football, athletics, um, um, and all sorts of sports. Also had the opportunity to represent Southwark 
in the London Youth Games. And you, lot of, you have a lot of swelling and children in the community. But when I went around, as I go around, sort of, I heard people say, uh, Councillor Blango did nothing for the Australian community. All he did was to establish sort of community games. And I say, but you're, that's for your children. That's for your children. Send your children there. There is benefit. Oh, what about for the adults? Well, I tried. You people failed me. So don't blame me. Yeah. Have so that's you, the story. Have you heard about the Ceylon um, UK COVID-19 rapid response team? Um, have, I've heard of it, yeah. yeah. You've seen us, and um, you saw what we did within the last um, yes. few weeks during the um, coronavirus, at the peak of the coronavirus, right? Yeah. I can tell you, um, after the show, I will engage with you on a private conversation. And for me, I, growing up in, um, in, the, in the UK, this is one of the most formidable team I've been with. We are a bunch of Salinians, 36 um, or more, and... Um, for 19 Hello? weeks. Yeah, I, I can hear you clearly. I can hear you. Hello? I can hear you clearly. I can hear you. I'm just losing you. Um, Hello? Yeah, I can hear you, um, uh, Blango. I can hear you. I think because you're moving about. Yeah. I can hear you. I just feel you're moving. You're moving about. So we're going to get Blango um, very, very soon. And... Uh, while we're going to get Blango very soon, I just want to say, look, I've been absolutely fascinated. You know, one of the key reasons why I wanted to bring Blango here uh, on this program and uh, people whilst we try to establish uh, 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 connections with Blango is for us to understand as Salinians that we are in a mindset of judging people based on not what we understand, what we feel we know. That's what we do largely Australianians. Thank you.